G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Best Fiends a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, have you ever just disappeared without a trace and your family has begun wondering where you are? Well, I did that the other day after I ate breakfast to score a little bit of extra time with Best Fiends. Others may wonder where you got off to, but if you're having as much fun with Best Fiends as I am, then it's no secret why you're sneaking off to play. With Best Fiends, you play through an actual storyline, which helps with the satisfying feeling of progression. It's also an awesome brain-boosting puzzle game that is great for downtime. I really like playing it when I'm on a long trip somewhere, stuck on a train or in a car or something. There are tons of unique fiends to collect, and with offline play, even when you're stranded, you have something to keep you entertained. Best Fiends is now my go-to game at night too, when I'm chilling in bed and I can't sleep. And not to brag, but I'm over a thousand levels in now and I still can't put the game down. In fact, 30 minutes can feel a lot like 30 seconds with how much fun I'm having. But there are tons of levels with new challenges coming online all year round, and with thousands of levels to chew through, there is always something new to do. It's also free to download and is endless amounts of fun. So, download your new favorite getaway, Best Fiends, for free today on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. So I'm from Australia and when I was 8 years old, my family lived in a house off the Pacific Highway. It backed off to bushland and had a, quite a large backyard, I suppose. But I used to play outside all the time because of this. One day I was outside as usual as well and heard my mum call my name, so I ran inside to see what she wanted, hoping that it was lunchtime. When I got there, she was busy washing up and she said, Where are you off to in a hurry? She had been watching me from the kitchen window, which overlooked the backyard. I said, You called me in. She said that she hadn't called me in though and that I must have imagined it. I just thought that she was messing with me at first and said, Come on mum, why'd you call on me? She stopped what she was doing and looked down at me and said, Sweetie, I didn't call you. Maybe you just heard the neighbours yelling and it sounded like me. But I was adamant that it was her. It sounded exactly the same as the hundreds of other times that she called me. I started to get a little bit grumpy at this and said that it was definitely her. But she told me to go back playing and that lunch would be ready soon. This is when I started to cry and demand that she stop messing with me. Suddenly I had her attention and she asked why I was so sure that it was her. I told her the reasoning that it sounded exactly like her. She eventually comforted me and convinced me that it must have just been my imagination. The next week went by as normal as well until one night I awoke to a tapping or a scratching noise. I looked around and when my eyes adjusted to the light, I couldn't see anything in my room, so I just assumed that it was an animal in the walls or the roof. Possums quite commonly come into the house for warmth and to nest in Australia, so I tried to get back to sleep. It went on though for what felt like maybe half an hour, so I looked around again and listened closely to the noise. And that was when I saw something in my peripherals at my window. I gazed over and saw what to this day still gives me chills. It was a thin figure, about two inches wide. It had elongated arms and fingers, all black and white eyes. It was tapping on my window while staring at me. I stared at it for a moment, not believing what I was seeing, thinking that I must just be dreaming or something. But for some reason, I just felt like it was toying with me, like it was saying, I'm coming to get you. Fear took over at that point. I stuffed my head under the blankets and I screamed as loudly as I could for my mum. I didn't stop screaming as well and didn't hear my mum come in and when she grabbed the blanket to see what was wrong, I jumped back thinking that whatever the heck was outside my window had somehow got in. She asked me in a frantic sort of way what was wrong. I pointed over to the window and said that, but it was gone and she asked me what it was. I explained what I had saw, slowly as I was trembling and could barely get the words out to describe it. She said that I could come and sleep in her room. I didn't get any sleep that night, nor the next few nights afterwards. 
I can still see the image in my mind as well, as clear as the night that it happened 18 years ago. It has made me afraid of the dark, and to this day I still sleep with the lights or the TV on. I've tried to rationalize it, I've tried to find answers in paranormal sightings, folklore, or dreamtime stories here. I thought I actually found the answer about five years ago when I learned about Mimi spirits. They resembled what I saw at first until I read it and it discussed with elders that they're sort of small and shy and are in no way harmful. Apparently they look after the land and don't like interacting with other beings, so obviously I crossed that off the list as a possibility. And to this day, I still have no idea what it was. But I have a feeling that it was the thing that called my name that time, mimicking my mother's voice. It's obviously made me think that it's much like a skinwalker. However, we really don't have any tales of those in Australia. The closest thing to that here is the Bunyip, a shapeshifter that lives in billabongs and attacks passing travellers. Well, there's just no bodies of water nearby, so I also cross that off. Obviously, I thought that maybe it was all in my head, that my mother was right and it was just my imagination. Yep, still, the image is so strongly imprinted in my mind, as is the voice. To be completely honest though, I still have no idea if it was real or if it was something trying to lure me away or what it was. What I do know though is that I will remember it until the day that I die. In July of 2019, I was leaving a co-worker or a friend's house on a 4th of July party. It was about 10.45pm. It was me, a 36-year-old female, my husband, 54-year-old male, and our then 9-year-old daughter. It was in a town about 45 minutes drive from home, mostly down country roads that I didn't know, so I was using my GPS. Now, this area of town basically rolls up the streets, so to speak, at 5 so the roads were mostly deserted with only a few cars passing every now and then and absolutely no cars in front of or behind us. But all of a sudden this very dark vehicle, I think it was a, a hunter green or maybe a dark grey, pulls up behind us and starts to tailgate my car. I don't normally speed more than 5 to 6 miles per hour over the speed limit so someone tailgating me is not really unusual I suppose. The longest stretch of this two-lane road before being able to hit the highway was a sort of winding tree-lined road. There was this big curve in the road, almost a hairpin turn that was not a sharp. So you could almost see a mile in the distance from where you entered that section of the road to where you came out of it. And there were no turn-offs, no shoulders to stop on, nothing. Just road and trees. When I entered the huge curve, the car was still right on my tail. Not flashing, not weaving, not using the horn or anything, just still following right on my tail. So, all of a sudden, I look in the rearview mirror and the headlights from the car that was tailgating me were gone. I didn't see any parking or marker lights. I didn't see any tail lights. I looked back as far as I could see and I couldn't see that car anywhere. I mentioned this to my husband and he started looking around behind us and didn't see them anymore. They were just gone. Again, there was just nowhere at all to stop and turn around or turn off or anything. I quickly turned my attention to the directions on my GPS and forgot about that car though. And about a half a mile after the huge curve in the road, there was a stop sign where I had to take a left onto the road that leads to the highway and closer to civilization. When I stopped at the stop sign, there were no cars coming or going in either direction. But just as I was about to hit the gas and make my left turn, there was a, a knock near my back driver's side window. I looked on my side mirror but didn't see anything. I heard another knocking sound close to the same spot but more in the middle of the car and not quite on the window now. My husband started turning to look back and I asked my daughter if she saw anything but neither of them did. So I said, oh well, guess we're just hearing things. And I made the left hand turn and kept on going. But as I made my left turn, I glanced back at the entrance to that road one more time. And there were a pair of headlights lighting up the road right where my car had just sat. And two people 
I was too far away to make out details, were returning to the dark colored vehicle that I had seen before. Now, I can't say this for sure, but I'm almost positive that had I opened my window or door to find the source of the knocking, something horrible would have happened to my family and myself that night. So what if Sherlock Holmes's most villainous nemesis was actually an innocent man? Well, don't miss the new Audible original, Moriarty, The Devil's Game. It's a bold new addition to the Sherlock Holmes universe, starring Dominic Monaghan from the Lord of the Rings trilogy and Lost in the title role. Moriarty turns one of literature's most famous rivalries on its head. It pits genius against genius in an epic origin story that recasts Professor James Moriarty as a desperate fugitive framed for murder, hunted by dark forces who will stop at nothing to exploit his brilliance. With Sherlock Holmes, Scotland Yard, and the British Crown closing in on him, Moriarty must confront the ultimate question. What will it take to prove his innocence? And if he succeeds, what will he become? I particularly appreciated and enjoyed the amount of sound effects and the immersive atmosphere that the story incorporates. For instance, the subtle movements of the characters can be heard as they talk over tea. And as someone who has incorporated a lot of sound effects into stories myself, I know just how much effort has gone into making this series just perfect, and it was a real treat to just kick back and listen in a dark room at night. Moriarty, The Devil's Game. It takes a villain to create one. Visit audible.com slash listen to Moriarty and listen now. In 2014, I moved to England from Canada to gain work or travel experience and also to find myself. I ended up living in Essex with three other roommates. They were all women, all a bit older than I was. I was 24 at the time. Megan was 31, Cherry was 34, and Cassie was 38. Megan was from New York, and Cherry was from New Jersey, and Cassie was from Poland. All four of us shared this three-story flat. The back of our home was the living room and kitchen. The back wall was complete glass that looked out into the garden. The garden was completely fenced in, and the house had uh, an interesting dynamic to say the least. Tons of stories from that time in my life, but I'll stick to this one. So, I adore all of my roommates, except for Cherry. After living with Cherry for seven months, I was over her antics. One day, I came home from work. I locked the door, make myself something to eat, and go up to bed. I brought some work home with me, so I'm in my nightie with all these papers around me and my headphones on jamming out. I had headphones on because Cherry was out to dinner with work friends. That meant booze and then soon after that a tantrum was surely to come. I just didn't want to have to listen to her crazy scream crying that night. I'm working away completely focused until I feel something. I look up to see a, a man standing over me. I don't register it right away and passively say, Cherry's room is on the second floor, and continue to work. Cherry regularly brought strange men home, but he doesn't leave. Again, I say, Cherry's room is downstairs, you... He then interrupts. I'm not here for Cherry, he says. A cold chill iced my veins. My fight or flight kicked in just then, and I started surveying the situation. I look him up and down. He has a bottle of Prosecco in one hand and a knife in the other. He's about 5'10", wild muddy brown hair, and really black eyes. He has a light polo shirt on, and a side of his collar has popped up, a distinct Manchester accent. Once I focused in, I realized that his eyes were black because his pupils were completely dilated. I was in trouble. I needed an escape plan, but unfortunately, this man was standing in between me and my bedroom door. Obviously, I needed to get downstairs, but I needed for him to think that it was his idea. So, I decided to play along. Just then, he uses his knife to pop the cork. Presco is starting to flow out onto my carpet. I said, oh no, let's clean that up. I prefer to drink out of proper flute anyways. He nodded, replying, Yeah, you're a proper classy bird, let's go. I try to act as natural as possible. 
I try not to show that I'm shaking all over and try to gain control over my breathing. We take the long journey down to the main floor of my flat, all three floors. He has the back of my nightie bunched up in one hand and I could feel the point of the knife graze my back with his other. I was trying to playfully speak with him as he walked down the stairs. I couldn't tell you what I was saying, I was most likely just rambling I think. I couldn't really hear anything too, over my heart beating in my ears. We get to the bottom of the stairs and there's a hallway to my left that leads to the front door. On my right, which is much closer to us, is the kitchen and the living room. We make our way into the kitchen. I point to the cabinets that we had the wine glasses in. He said that he knew where they were and started heading towards them. I now had the kitchen table in between us and it was time to run. I burst into a sprint down the hallway towards the door. My hands fumbled over the locks, shaking and sweating. I swing open the door and see two men walking across the street. They must have been walking home from the train or something. There was a big train station in front of our home. I call out to them for help and suddenly I'm flung onto the ground. Little pebbles pierce my skin, sending sharp pains where they jabbed. The intruder pushed me out of the way to run and escape. One of the men chased after the intruder while the other said for me to go inside while he surveyed my home and called the police. I locked the doors and I called the cops. While I'm on the phone with dispatch, I manically run around the house to double check all the windows and the doors are shut. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang on my door. I inform the dispatch of the banging and she informs me that police weren't there yet. I thought it might be one of the gentlemen who helped me, so I go to look out the eye hole and it's him, the intruder. He came back. He's banging on the door screaming that I had his glasses and that he was not done with me. I absolutely freaked out, obviously. The dispatcher attempts to calm me down, but I'm losing my ever-loving mind over this. She then said, they're pulling onto your street now. You should hear their sirens. And I did. Thank God. The intruder then blasts off. One officer jumps out of the passenger side while the car is still moving and chases after him. The second officer comes into my home and he interviews me over the course of some time. And the two gentlemen. Collects evidence, takes photos, all that stuff. After some time of him being there, Cherry comes home and freaks out. Once the situation was explained to her, she said, Oh, that could have been me. Yeah, thanks Cherry. It's all about you, right? The next morning, I'm called in to identify a man that they had in custody. I pointed him out. I go into a little room and the officer pulls out an evidence bag. He asked if the items were mine. And they were... There were my underwear and photos taken from my home. The officer then informed me that the intruder had apparently been stalking me for some time now. He estimates at least three months and he had made a nest outside of our home on top of a hill that looked over into our living room and kitchen even. He's apparently a, a known offender and drug dealer. He then told me how lucky I was to get out practically unharmed because... Apparently, others weren't so lucky. So I've been searching for some semblance of similarity in somebody else's encounter for three years now, hoping that another's experience might align even a bit with my own to validate it. Until last night... I'd found details aligning with my own encounter, but nothing I felt concrete enough to make my story not sound absolutely insane. It still does sound a bit insane, I know, and I have no way to further explain any of it. So all I have is what I witnessed. I did find a story on here from like 18 days ago that sounds eerily similar to my own, though. The key difference being the familiarity of the voices mimicked, leading me to wonder if this thing had been watching us for a while. Anyway, so I was living in West Texas in this national park where the restaurant I was working at at the time rested at the top of a 15 minute hike of a mountain trail from the housing that they had us in. I closed up the restaurant after everyone left each night, so I was always an hour or two later coming down the hill than everybody else. Usually it was pretty empty, really quiet, pretty uncommon to encounter anyone else as the only thing at the top of the mountain is the closed restaurant, a gift shop, a, a store and some of the trailheads. 
there isn't much reason for anyone else to be on the trail at that hour. And this one night, I'm coming down. No moon, so it was completely pitch black. Empty trail. Characteristically quiet. Around this last bend to get to my house, and right before I get off the trail to take a shortcut through the thicket of the cactus and brush, there were maybe 15 to 20 trees. Even though it's a desert, the top of the mountain has a high Sierra microclimate. When I hear my best friend or roommate call out my name, clear as day, in the other direction. He said my name, and when I turned, said it again. In retrospect, though, it sounded, I don't know, funny. It was close, 15 yards maybe, but it sounded sort of far off at the same time. Like if somebody recorded his voice from far away but played it very nearby. It just sounded off, but not enough to flip a switch immediately, and maybe I'm painting the memory of it differently than what it actually sounded like. So I'm facing my house, maybe 50 yards away, and the voice comes from directly to my left, on this foothill of the mountain that we'd hike around on sometimes. It has so much more tree coverage than the trail that I was on, and considerably more than the thicket separating me from the clearing surrounding my house. If you walked five feet in the direction the voice came from, you'd completely disappear from the view of anyone on the trail or on the back porch of the house, like immediately. So hearing my friend's voice calling me over, I was like, oh cool, we're night hiking. And I turned to follow it. But right before I take my first step into the tree line, I hear his actual voice down on our porch saying, hey, who are you talking to? which obviously stops me. I turn back to my house, confused, just in time to see this, and it's really hard to explain, but thing burst out of the thicket that I was just about to shortcut through to begin with before hearing this first voice and turning away, and from the exact spot I had walked down every single night, this thing just bolts. It was humanoid technically, but it was tall, and way too skinny to be a human, like at least 8 feet tall but super slim. It looked inhumanely slender in fact. It was hunched over and running like it burst off of a track mark, that sort of thing, but kept that same form the whole time, never got all the way upright. As for the colour, that's always really messed with me because for one, I'm really colourblind, and for some reason, it was like greenish, sort of yellow, and I get greens and yellows mixed up a lot. It had a hue of green and yellow, though, at least, and it looked like it was giving off its own sort of, I don't know, like glow or something, which has always sounded so absolutely ludicrous. I never tell anyone that I do not absolutely trust to give me the benefit of the doubt before thinking that I'm just making the whole thing up. Because if I heard this story, I would honestly think that somebody, at the very least, might be confused or something. Anyway, our back porch light was on though, and the thing lined up with where it would have been shining, so if this thing was translucent, it definitely could have taken on that, like, sheen by reflecting the porch light. The colours did kind of line up, I guess. If you'd reflected the light, it may have looked like this thing's colours, I suppose, but... It certainly wasn't identical. Honestly though, I could have sworn that it had its own shine to it. Like looking at a glow stick that's sort of dying off. More than enough to see, but still kind of faint. Regardless, it was a light that definitely wasn't there a second before when I'd gotten to the shortcut. It would have stuck out for at least 50 yards of the walk. It should be noted too, had I followed that thing's voice, two things probably would have happened. One, I would have completely disappeared from the view of anyone. And two, I would have turned my back on whatever that thing was and entered into a thicket of trees, weeds, and cactus far too dense for me to turn around, run, or fight back, or pretty much anything. Also, that trail that I would have been gone towards leads directly to the edge of a cliff that drops down into a massive break in the mountain. It cleanly drops all of like 6,000 feet to the wide open desert below. That could be the purpose of that direction, maybe. Who knows? To be honest, though, if I was going to try and do some nefarious stuff, it would be the perfect place to both find someone and lead them quickly to a spot where no one else would come up on you. Legit, in the middle of the day, you could probably make someone disappear over there if you wanted. 
it really wouldn't be that hard. Anyway, how this thing was running, it immediately felt like I'd spooked it. Like how a deer runs off at a noise, but this was different in that it seemed a lot more, I don't know, determined? It seemed intelligent, aware of its own movement, not just acting out of instinct. Kind of like spooking a person if they'd seen you watching them from the bushes or something. Like spooked but sentient and definitely acting like I just foiled some nefarious plan. So naturally, I also bolted, exposing my back to this thing but taking the opposite slightly longer way to my back porch. My buddy, and bless his soul, is still there when I make it and he asks again, who are you with? His face is just as confused and he keeps looking past me and I'm like, you heard it too, right? And he says, yeah, where are they? And I was like, what? There were multiple? Apparently, from his perspective, he had heard multiple voices alongside of my own, all carrying on and joking around, talking back and forth pretty loudly. He said that there were at least three other voices talking to mine, but that it sounded like a, a whole crowd coming down the trail. He said that he could clearly hear us getting closer, and for the past few minutes, it just assumed that I'd run into a hiking group and were talking with them as we headed down. Which is not the most uncommon thing in the daytime, but pretty uncommon for that hour of night. It took me a minute to show him that I wasn't messing with him and that I had not just split off from a group of hikers. I was completely alone and had not vocalized a word until he called up to ask, who are you with? It took a second to even express my side of what was going on. I was so out of whack, I couldn't find the words to actually explain, so I just kept shouting, I swear I just heard your voice, and then, this thing dude, this thing, or something like that. Eventually it registers that there were no lights on the trail. I wasn't using a flashlight that night, so maybe there was actually some moon out, and... I had just heard his voice calling me off trail and into the dark and we both began trying to figure out what the heck we just witnessed. Now, this part might be a little crazy but I'm not implying anything, I'm just saying. This is what I'd been doing on the walk down before this happened so obviously walking home solo I hadn't actually said a word. Whoever he heard was certainly not me and I certainly didn't come with a crowd. I had been praying like crazy on the hike down. There had just been this super dark sort of negative energy in the house lately and I was trying to kind of, I don't know, surround myself with light and positivity I guess, asking God to give me strength before I walked back in and out of nowhere, midway through the trail, I got this like absolutely overwhelming joy, almost like ecstasy. I was like screaming inside happy and just felt like I could take on the whole world basically like no matter what came I could take it maybe I'm implying something because call me crazy but I've always felt like that had something to do with how the night turned out as opposed to how it maybe would have I don't know I know that part really does make me sound insane but so does the rest of it to be honest so whatever I certainly don't think that it was a coincidence though. I'm just not sure what to make of, well, any of it really. And that's pretty much it. The only other thing is our memories of it really. Out of nowhere I just sort of stopped thinking of it. Not like forgot it, but like it was hidden behind some sort of a thick fog in my head. The next morning I told my friend the story and she uncharacteristically shut me down and just said something like you're all just crazy and getting scared of these mountains and just walked away. It really wasn't like her though to just dismiss somebody like that, especially a friend, without even hearing them out too. She was a really empathetic lady and again call me crazy but it seemed like something that triggered a memory in her that she refused to touch and shut it down before it got too close. I could be reading into it, I admit, but that's happened a couple of times with this story and we'd been living on that mountain off and on for a few years at that point and had never once heard or seen anything remotely similar to that thing. Until that night, we'd never even heard a story even vaguely resembling that. 
I mean, it just wasn't like we got spooked of our own house or the trail that we took twice a day every day. And it wasn't like we were seeing and hearing things based on stories that we projected into the darkness, you know. But the weirdest, the absolute weirdest thing happened the moment that she walked away. It was legit like, like a fog just slowly poured over the memory and the last time I remember thinking of it was that moment. And then it just disappeared for months. How in the world does something that massive, that frightening happen in your life and you just stop thinking about it? And then one day, it just popped back up. I was honestly so surprised and unsure of how I hadn't thought of it in so long. It was almost more baffling than anything we actually witnessed. I asked my friend just before I sent this and if he'd felt the same fog thing and he said, absolutely. He doesn't really like talking about that night, honestly, and he's told me that I cannot help but bring it up as often as possible, hoping by talking it through that we'd find some sort of explanation for, well, any of what happened. Even as I share this though, I felt like I'd asked him a million times already and just forgotten his answer. Maybe I have and I've just forgotten or had that fog thing happen again. I don't know. I'm getting all confused and this whole thing is just crazy, I know. But that's pretty much everything. I'm sorry if this was really confusing and all over the place. But I really felt like I, I needed to convey as absolutely many details as I could possibly remember just in case somebody listening to this had any sort of experience with any part of it. A mimic, a, a humanoid, or the memory loss, or anything. I really don't know what to make of all of this. All I have are the details of that night and my foggy memory doing something bizarre afterward. I've never known what to make of it, but I just figured maybe somebody else might be in the same boat as me and maybe need to see some sort of validation. Just validation, I guess. Anyway, thanks for listening, and it's good to finally speak about this, even if it's just over the internet.